Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's Safety and Health webcast, Heat Stress and Cold Stress, Responses and Recommendations, sponsored by Bulwark. My name is Barry Botino, and I am an associate editor with Safety and Health Magazine. I'll be your moderator today. Thank you so much for joining us. For our, from our team here at the National Safety Council, which is currently working remotely, we hope that you're all safe and healthy amid the COVID-19 pandemic. In a few minutes, we'll start the presentation, but first I'd like to go over just a few housekeeping items. The views of today's speaker and organization are their own and do not necessarily reflect those of the National Safety Council or Safety and Health Magazine. Any mention of a commercial enterprise, product, or publication does not mean the council or the magazine endorses those items. After today's presentation, we'll conduct a question and answer session with our speaker. To ask a question, simply type it in the text box, which is in the lower left-hand corner of your screen, and click the button for submit question. Feel free to ask your question at any time at all during the presentation. You do not have to wait for the Q&A session to begin. We'll try to answer as many questions as possible, but we might not be able to get to every question. The good news is that any questions we don't get to, it will be forwarded along to our speaker today. If you happen to have any technical issues during this webcast, please refer to our list of helpful tips, which is located on the right-hand portion of your screen. For basic troubleshooting information, click the Help button located at the bottom of your screen. At the end of the webcast, you'll be asked to complete a brief evaluation survey, but I'll tell you more about that a little bit later. This webcast will be archived, so you can access it after today's live event. To view this webcast and all of our past webcasts, visit us online at safetyandhealthmagazine.com slash events. With that, let's introduce our presenter. Our speaker today is Derek Sang, who serves as the Technical Training Manager at Bulwark Protection and is an expert in flame-resistant and arc-rated clothing. For more than 25 years, Derek has been involved in the FR clothing industry in a variety of roles, including the service, manufacturing, and garment sides of the business. Derek also stands above the crowd as an educator and a speaker. He's developed more than 250 informational and educational seminars and he's presented those seminars around the globe. Derek has also served as a keynote speaker on the hazards of arc flash and flash fire, along with numerous other safety topics. Again, we thank you all for joining us today for this presentation, and Derek, whenever you're ready, go ahead and take it away. Well, Barry, thank you for that extremely kind introduction, and uh, good morning, good afternoon, live or archived, however you are consuming it, this webinar. I first and foremost want to thank you for taking your valuable time to learn a little bit more about FR and the elements. So let's get on with it. Let's get the legal stuff out of the way so we can start rocking and rolling here. So this presentation is for informational purposes only. Customers of Bulwark Protection are solely responsible for conducting their own hazard risk assessment to identify safety hazards in their work environment. Customers of Bulwark Protection are solely responsible for selecting appropriate garments and, prote and personal protective equipment for their employees. Employers must ensure wearers use, care, and maintain their garments and personal protective equipment properly. As working conditions and other factors vary, Bulwark Protection does not make any representation that these garments and personal protective equipment will protect wearers from injury. So when we are out in the field in the good old days, almost, because we don't get to do that as much as we like to, the premise of this presentation is we get tons of questions around flame-resistant clothing, arc-rated clothing, and what to do in case of extreme conditions, specifically the heat of the summer and the cold of the winter. So our goal today is We'll talk a little bit about what heat stress and cold stress is at a very basic level. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about flame-resistant arc-rated clothing and how that may play a factor into those conditions. Uh, what are some best practices to avoid heat stress and cold stress? Uh, and what should you look for when selecting flame-resistant and arc-rated clothing when looking at extreme conditions? So first and foremost, a few definitions. Uh, like many folks who have tons of acronyms and what they do, sometimes I ramble on and forget 
that not everybody spends the large quality of their working day immersed in this environment. So when we talk about fire retardants, that is not garments. Fire retardant is the chemical additive that suppresses fire by interrupting the fire flow, the fire tetrahedron. Flame resistant, that is what the properties are or the engineering that's imparted into fibers and fact fi fibers and fabrics and ultimately into clothing. All it does is self-extinguishes and does not support combustion. It does not melt, drip, and or add to the injury. Arc rated, that's when we take flame resistant garments or flame resistant fabrics specifically, conduct additional testing for that specific hazard, and then we rate it through an ATPV or an E sub BT and give you an arc rating so you can match that up against your incident energies. For today's discussion purposes, and re really market-wide, we use FRAR uh, to talk about clothing. Uh, so flame-resistant arc-rated garments. And then obviously heat and cold stress today is really the general name for several medical conditions, as we will soon discuss. So we work in hazardous environments. My garments are designed as secondary PPE for wearers who could potentially be exposed to accidental thermal events such as arc flash, flash fire, and molten metals. So what happens when we throw Mother Nature in the mix and she becomes part of the hazard, whether you're working in extreme cold or extreme hot, and that's what we're going to focus on today. So who's at risk of environmental stress? Well, really, anybody working in a hot, cold environment may be at risk of environmental stress, and it doesn't necessarily have to be outside. Uh, obviously, our line crews, our drilling crews are outside, but our casting folks, our glass makers are inside. In a non-FR world, it's pretty easy to figure out. We look at our landscapers, our snow cleanup crews, our sanitation workers, and specifically our first responders. So there's a lot of folks who interact with mother nature or the environment more specifically where it can get to the extremes. So what is heat stress? As I mentioned earlier, uh, heat stress is a buildup of body heat generated either internally by muscle use or externally by the environment. Several heat-induced illnesses can result in uh, heat rash, heat cramps, heat exhaustion, and ultimately and potentially, finally, uh, heat stroke. Uh, we know what the contributors are. Uh, we understand that lack or poor hydration can lead to heat illnesses. Uh, lack of rest breaks, just going redlining for as long as we can in an extreme environment like heat will cause problems, so we lack of rest breaks. Lack of shade, being able to get somewhere where at least I can get that radiant load off of me. And then also there's us. How do we go into that environment? Are we in good physical condition? Have we prepared ourselves for it? Or do we have underlying conditions that we need to take note of? And it's also been studied extremely, especially when you look at, okay, look at the people who pay lots and lots of money to perform at peak levels. We have lots of studies of how the human body can interact with extremes. And it's been shown that as little as 3% reduction in hydration can cause 17% reduction in reaction time. Where do we see that? Look at your high-end athletics. If I'm hitting a line drive at a shortstop and he's poorly hydrated, he's not going to react as fast. A top flight receiver running a fly pattern 40 yards downfield in the fourth quarter uh, may not react as well as he did in the first two minutes of the start of the game. That's how quickly hydration and lack of can factor into things like reaction time. How does that show up in our world? Well, at the end of an eight-hour shift in an 80-degree day, and I've been getting uh, dealing with uh, heat, uh, could I slip? Could I not react as fast? Could I have an error in judgment? Could I see things or move a little bit slowly? Uh, we all know that uh, things factor into having accidents uh, such as reaction time, such as uh, fatigue. So we know that these things can factor into causing uh, incidents on our work site. 
So as I remember, as I said, heat stress is a umbrella for a lot of different heat-related illnesses. And as we talk about them here, we're talking about the reduction of fluid or the lack of hydration or loss of bodily fluids through uh, as they escalate. So heat rash. Uh, obviously, we're starting to have excessive sweat. Where will you see things like heat rash? In contact areas, behind the knees, in the elbows, underneath the armpits. Uh, heat cramps. Now we've got to the point to where we're actually feeling our digits. Uh, we start to, uh, we're making a fist all day. We're grabbing our tools, and all of a sudden we're cramping up a little bit. We might fe feel it in the soles of our feet, in that really annoying little place in our arch, in the back of our legs, and our calves, and our hamstrings. We're starting to cramp up because we're losing electrolytes and we're losing fluid. Uh, now we keep going and we push through that. Now we're getting into heat exhaustion. Your body is starting to shut down and it's starting to look to preserve itself. It's starting to find to where it's pulling things away from the extremities and it's starting to focus them on keeping the big organs uh, working. And then finally we get down and we go past that. We're into heat stroke, which is the most serious. Uh, the body's unable to control or monitor its temperature. The body's temperature is rising rapidly. Sweating mechanism has completely failed, and the body's now unable to cool down. Uh, heat stroke can cause death or permanent disability if emergency is not given uh, very rapidly. So you have a couple of indicators as you go through here. There is no guideline about how long you will stay in one of these phases. It's not like, oh, if I've got heat rash, I've got another 90 minutes. No, you can go from heat rash to heat stroke individually rapidly. There is no set uh, way of going through these indicators of heat illness. As I mentioned, uh, there are, uh, we do know what leads to it. We do know what factors into it. Uh, these are not in any specific order as far as priority or anything, but from a common sense standpoint, uh, we do know that we do not deal with uh, heat as well at 25 as we now do at, at 50. Uh, so age factors in, our fitness level is directly correlated to our efficiency of sweat or the ability to cool ourselves down. Our body mass index will factor into it. Uh, dehydration we talked about, how do we uh, contribute to that? Well, obviously, use of alcohol, uh, use of caffeine. In fact, in many cases in my oil and gas community, in my uh, drilling community, they have basically said, hey, you guys can't consume these energy drinks because every uh, ingredient on there is almost a caffeine-related ingredient, and it causes uh, dehydration. And then obviously certain medications, we've got to be very aware if we are working in any extremes that we communicate with our medical professionals and then communicate to our company what those medications can and cannot do under uh, or cold conditions. Obviously your diet, low sodium, high sodium, do we get a correct mix of vitamins and electrolytes? Are we consuming the right stuff? Activity level, how active are we during the workday? How active are we being asked to be during the workday? And the other big one, we'll talk about this here shortly, is lack of acclimation. One of the leading studies today is how acclimated or how much time are we giving our people to get acclimated? For example, if I transfer from, uh, let's say, the uh, oil and gas extraction fields up in uh, North Dakota in the Bakken down to the Permian in uh, June or in January, those conditions, depending on where I came from to where I'm going, can be dramatically different. I know myself, I've left Arizona in February to Fargo, North Dakota, and I've had a 100 degree swing in temperature. It's minus 20 in Fargo, and it's 80 in Arizona. I've had a 100-degree swing, and I'm not doing anything. So imagine working outside where you were warm and comfortable one minute to where you're working in minus 20 degrees. We have to acclimate to those conditions. And there's a lot of evidence today that that is a really strong and highly best practice. 
So how does the body cool itself? Well, real basic, we have four uh, levers that we can pull within our uh, biosystem. Uh, radiation, heat is radiated through the skin and absorbed by the cooler air. Uh, conduction, direct contact with cool objects. Just grabbing a uh, bottle of water out of the cooler and holding it on our forehead can make us feel temporarily a little bit better. That's conduction. Convection, moving air from breeze fans, that kind of swamp cooler effect. Even if I'm sweaty and hot and I stand in front of a fan that's even blowing warm air, just that air moving alone can help cool me down. And then evaporative cooling, that's water from our blood absorbs heat and rises to the skin surface via sweat glands, and we evapor the evaporation process helps cool the body down. The challenge is in our work environment when the ambient air temperature rises above our body temperature, we only have one mechanism left to cool us down, and that's our evaporatory cooling system, a.k.a. sweat. And that's why hydration is so important, because that system is only going to work as long as you are hydrated and can continue to sweat. So there is obviously going to be a response escalation. As we go through those steps that we talked about, or those heat-related illnesses all the way from uh, rash to stroke, that severity is going to increase, and we got to have a matching response. We can obviously, as we're starting to notice ourselves overheat, we can rest in a cool, shaded, air-conditioned area. We can have them drink uh, plenty of water to replenish and rehydrate uh, and get that system back online. If we are going down to now to where we're going into possible medical uh, situation where we're trying to prevent the onset of heat stroke and it's moving on rapidly, then we have to have access to uh, do we have ice on site? Can we bag up that ice? Can we break ice packs and start getting them where? We all know the key areas, under the arm, in the groin, the back of the neck, and then we're calling 911 because we've went past those minor situations into severe. So how can our fabrics assist in cooling? How can our workwear, and we're talking about general workwear here before we get into the FRAR component of it, what can uh, fabrics do to assist in cooling? Well, we have a combination of three things, the weight, the weave, and the mechanics of those fibers that are in that weave. And they have to work together. No one of these in and of themselves is a solution to cooling. Lightweight, yes, less insulation will allow more heat to be released radiation. Open weave, more air permeability allows more air to cool and evaporate moisture. Remember, thinking about air moving through, that's why a breeze on a nice day, if that fabric is open and that air permeates through there, it will help. And then obviously having a moisture wicking component to where I'm pulling my sweat. So I'm assisting my body of getting this, the heat to the outer most layer of my skin and then assisting it then to getting to, to help that evaporatory process I want to have some moisture wicking component in there so obviously from preventing or minimizing heat stress we want to know the symptoms first and foremost monitor your personal physical condition and that of your colleagues dress properly for the heat schedule regular breaks that include rest and shade and stay hydrated Avoid, uh, you know, alcohol and caffeine-related drinks. And then start looking at proper engineering controls, safe work practices, and personal protective equipment provided by your employer to assist in prevention of heat stress. So moving to the other extreme, the yin of the yang, the other side of that coin, we go from hot to cold. A lot of attention placed on heat stress, a lot of focus and resources on heat stress, but cold stress can be equal. Uh, it's the general name also for several medical conditions when the body's unable to warm itself. 
Several cold-induced illnesses, such as hypothermia, frostbite, chill blains, trench foot, can occur. Chill blains, kind of, again, that same, uh, we're having heat loss, so what can we expect? Chill blains are a painful inflammation of small blood vessels in your skin that occur in response to repeated exposure to cold, but not freezing air. Uh, trench foot or immersion foot is caused by having feet immersed in cold water for long periods of time, similar to frostbite, but considered less severe. Uh, frostbite occurs when the layers of skin and tissue begin to freeze. Typically, we see these on the extremities, where tip of the nose, cheeks, earlobes, hands, fingers, uh, feet, toes, etc. And then as we had in uh, heat stroke, hypothermia, that's where we're going into uh, extreme conditions where fatality is potentially uh, an outcome. Common factors, again, you'll see some familiarity here. Age, ability to regulate body heat decreases with age. Fitness level, again, how well you are at getting rid of heat, how well you are at retaining heat or warming yourself up. Uh, medications can interfere with the body's ability to generate heat normally. Uh, diet, are we getting enough calories? And we'll talk about that shortly. Activity level, uh, we want to monitor that because uh, where sweating in the heat was how we cooled ourselves, sweating in the cold is not ideal. So understanding the body's warming mechanism, uh, heat flows from high temperature to low temperature environment. So if my body is warm, and I'm going to naturally send that heat out into the environment. If I do that uh, too long and I'm not insulated, pretty much if I have a negative 20 environment and I have a positive 98.6, eventually I'm going to lose enough heat that my 98.6 will get into danger levels, and it doesn't take a lot. Uh, three to four degrees uh, reduction in body temperature can absolutely lead to uh, hypothermia. So in hot environments, we want to release excess heat, less clothing, lower activity levels, and we want to be able to sweat. In cold environments, we want to have additional clothing, increase insulation, increase activity levels, and we'll talk about without sweating. So the challenge in the cold is when the ambient temperature is well below the body temperature, insulation is necessary and vital because that's the only way to artificially protect ourselves in this extremity. Uh, however, the concern for healthy fit workers is overheating and perspiring because then you become wet, then wet becomes cold, and then cold again can really uh, relate to uh, heat and uh, cold-induced illness. Once the workload is reduced, cold temperatures begin to eliminate the insulative capabilities of the clothing and will lower body temperature, increasing your risk of hypothermia. So again, we're now into that balancing act. As we saw in heat, as severity increases, we want to uh, move to a warm area. We want to stay active. We've all seen, we've all had We've all pumped our arms, stuck our hands and fingers underneath our armpits, and stomped our feet. That kind of activity is going to generate body heat, which is going to reduce the cold to a certain degree. Get out of wet clothing, replace with dry clothes or branches, and cover your head. Drink warm, not hot, sugary drinks such as sports drinks. Avoid caffeinated, and then uh, obviously as severity increases, get on to 911. Uh, how fabric can assist in warming you up. The right layering provides better insulation. That outermost layer, we want to have some at least water resistance. Doesn't need to be waterproof, but some water resistance would be nice. The ability to block wind on that outer layer, want to have a good tight weave. Uh, Moisture absorbing, not up against you, but up against that base layer that's going to be pulling moisture away from you because you want to stay dry. We want to have a moisture absorbing layer in that middle layer that's going to get that uh, wet away from you. So if you're dry and comfortable, you're going to feel warmer regardless of what's happening in your layering system. Obviously, know the symptoms of cold stress. Monitor your physical condition and that of your coworkers. Dress properly for the cold. 
stay dry in the cold because moisture or dampness from sweating can increase the rate of heat loss. This is key as you are monitoring your workload. And we'll talk about donning and doffing garments throughout the workday as you acclimate to that workload without producing sweat is ideal. Uh, keep extra clothing in your truck or in and around your locker, for example, because you want to get out of wet if you have started to perspire, because that will lead to you being cold. Uh, warm, sweetened fluids. Notice we've said that a couple times. I also mentioned your caloric intake, and we'll talk about that in specifics. But your body is a furnace trying to keep you warm. It needs calories in order to do that. And then, obviously, proper engineering controls, safe work practices, and uh, the appropriate PPE. So fabric in the hot and cold, we've kind of alluded to that. And in both cases, we want to have a moisture wicking layer. My body feels dry. I'm going to feel cold or hot, depending on what environment I'm in. Feeling dry or having the ability to get sweat off of my body, moisture away from me is going to help from an insulative component in, in the cold climate, and it's also going to help from a comfort standpoint in the hot environment. So we have to have a mixture of uh, hydrophobic and hydrophilic fibers in there. We want to look at a sophisticated, uh, at least at the base layer level, uh, to help keep us uh, either cool or warm. So what can employers do in uh, heat and or cold? Obviously, we're all aware that uh, heat, heat stress and cold stress or hot and cold are going to be recognizable hazards. If I put someone out in minus 20 or if I put someone out in 110, it's going to be very, very difficult to argue that those environments are not uh, hazards. So we have to train our people uh, on uh, what to do in there. We've talked about acclimating workers. Uh, those, and it can be as simple as someone taking a two-week vacation to somewhere cool during the hot of summer, uh, even as simple as going from uh, here, here in the valley where it's 110, going up north a couple hundred miles to where it's going to be 70, and I'm there for two weeks during the summer, then I come back. There has to be a scheduled acclimation component to my returning to work. There has to be a scheduled acclimation component to me as a new hire. Uh, is that mandated? Is that mandatory? No, it's not, but it is a recognized best practice. In fact, occupational physician Rhonda McCarthy says we see a dramatic decrease in workers' compensation costs when employers voluntarily adopt many of the measures recommended by NIOSH. And she emphasized the importance especially of training and acclimation programs leading to that dramatic decrease. So we know it works. Recommendations for employers in heat and cold. Uh, schedule maintenance and repair jobs when temperatures are not as severe. Uh, if that's starting at 4 a.m., 5 a.m., if that's uh, not working during uh, peak radiant load hours from, say, noon to 2, 3 o'clock in the afternoon, that's easily scheduled around. If that's pushing the workday start time to later, to maybe 8, 9 o'clock, to where at least we're getting uh, the sun up in the sky uh, during cool days, it just needs to be done. Reduce the physical demands of workers. Uh, obviously, during our hot months, uh, if we had a crew that would take uh, time to do double the size of the crew, add man hours to the job, because uh, you're not going to be able to get what you usually get productivity-wise in an eight-hour day with the same amount of people during uh, environmental extremes. 
Uh, provide warm and cool liquids uh, on the job site pretty easy. Provide warm or cool areas during break periods. This is, can be as simple as just pop-up tents on the side of your work area. It can be a pop-up tent and uh, getting some airflow through there, whether that is uh, fueled by just generators and that, getting some fans out there, whether that's some propane-powered heaters, whatever the case may be, it can be that simple and giving them a place to rest. Uh, monitor workers who are at risk of uh, hot and cold stress. One, if they've ever had either heat stress or cold stress, you're more susceptible to, so document and know that. Obviously, monitor the physical condition of our people and obviously monitoring the uh, age of our folks and what the expectations can be uh, as we go through that. Employers can take the following steps to protect themselves from heat and cold. Layering provides better insulation in the cold, and layering can be more comfortable in the heat. And we'll talk about the specifics as it leads to flame-resistant arc-rated clothing. Uh, loose clothing allows for better circulation in the cold and better airflow in the heat. Uh, purposely, de purposely designed clothing, designed with movement in mind, is beneficial in both hot and cold environments. Uh, make sure to minimize exposed skin from direct and indirect heat or cold. Uh, hand protection should be appropriate to the conditions. Boots should be appropriate to the conditions. Head protection should be incorporated, shade, insulation where possible, and monitor physical condition and train the people of knowing the signs. Things are getting worse. They're not getting better. As we look at our work environment, especially when we are looking at outside, both NASA and the American Meteorological Society predict we can expect both more intense and more frequent heat and cold events across the country. In fact, uh, just this week, we got another notification for the polar vortex happening. Uh, out here on the west, we had four storms uh, back to back. And obviously, those who are working in storm relief, whether that's in the heat of summer or the colder winter, are well aware that this is not uh, new. This is the new norm. Uh, even though we've heard that term uh, far too many times as it relates to the pandemic, this is the new norm for working in extreme conditions. And we do know that it can have disastrous outcomes. We've seen as many as, you know, just the numbers here that we talk about from the OSHA website. Uh, we've seen over 800 fatalities and 70,000 documented uh, workers injured and the injury is from heat stress. Hypothermia and frostbite, uh, no different. 23% of approximately 1,600 a year hypothermia fatalities are work-related. So we know that it's happening, we know that it's getting documented, and uh, we have to take that into consideration. So moving from general into our FRAR world, how does all that I've just said when we have to consider when clothing is also your PPE. When we have to factor in the flame resistant and arc rated protection, wearing the right clothing made from the right fabrics is extremely important. The flame resistant arc rated factor when it comes to layering. I think we all understand that when we talk about flame resistant and arc rated clothing in general, there is an education training component. You just can't wear whatever you want underneath your flame-resistant arc-rated clothing. Part of that training is you either A, wear nothing, or B, you're allowed natural fibers. Well, what are those natural fibers? Obviously, cotton, wool are the most common, and even silk. And why do we allow those? Because under thermal conditions, they will not melt, drip, and add to the injury. It doesn't say they won't ignite, but as long as that outermost layer is able to withstand the accidental thermal exposure, we don't have an ignition concern. All we don't want to do is injure, so we remove meltables. Now, when we're dealing with hot and cold, those base layers, you may want to incorporate flame-resistant arc-rated properties depending on your hazard because there is potential to expose those uh, base layers. Also, when you start looking at heat 
and insulation to counter uh, heat stress and counter cold stress, wearing two lighter weight layers, wearing a FRAR base layer with moisture wicking properties could potentially keep my workers cooler, uh, hold off heat stress, uh, provide insulation during uh, cold to where if I'm donning and doffing, I have flame resistant arc rated properties all the way through my system as I adapt to my workload and the cold environment. So we're going to go through five different things for cold, five different things with heat. So what do I want to do in the heat? So thing one, we know sweat is not as free to evaporate when the skin is covered. Even with breathable clothing, we're not as efficient, uh, but that's not really an option because remember, we're still primarily looking to protect against that arc flash or that flash fire. So obviously we have to keep our folks hydrated. Better yet, encourage them and train them that showing up hydrated is better than staying hydrated. Uh, we want to be able to drink throughout the day and continually drinking during our non-working hours to stay hydrated because that will only help in this situation. Obviously scheduling and properly scheduling rest breaks. Not like, hey, I'll get to resting, because what happens when we get focused on a task is we look to complete the task. We then lose track of time. So as a team, as a unit, as a entity, we want to make sure that we're formally scheduling rest breaks. And during those rest breaks, we're providing shade and better yet, cooling areas if possible. And then taking the personal uh, challenge to stay in shape and be careful to monitor medications and notify if you have to take medications that could potentially cause heat-related illness. Thing two, look for FR clothing that facilitates evaporation. Moisture wicking fibers, and this is important that these are part of the fiber matrix and ultimately the fabric and they're not a finish. There are many fabrics out there today that have a moisture wicking finish and it's durable for about 25 launderings, give or take. That would be about one season of use even though the fabric itself can last anywhere from two to two and a half years. You're only getting about half of a season or half of a year out of the moisture wicking finish. Look for open weave to allow air permeability. And this is where it gets a little interesting. I can get a lightweight fabric down around five and a half ounces. The problem is, is my weave has to be so tight to get the arc thermal performance value you want that my air permeability is very, very low. I could go to a little bit heavier, say I go to six and a half, almost seven ounces, but I'm able to open up that weave and still protect you, allow better air permeability and more comfort. My point is, is don't get micro-focused on just the weight of the fabric. Weight of the fabric is great, but when you're talking about a half an ounce to an ounce and getting better comfort performance, the only way you're going to know that is during a wear trial and getting it on your back. So be conscious of that. And then remember that heat is shed primarily by the evaporation of sweat. So the challenge is... As we talked about earlier, is when that ambient temperature is above body temperature, the only mechanism that you have is evaporation of perspiration. So you want to look for uh, fabrics that have incorporated some of that science to mimic your body's evaporatory system. Thing three, be careful utilizing PPE that involves layers and or primarily barriers. Yes, as you layer up to protect yourself, depending on the conditions, you can increase your susceptibility to heat stress. So there are times you have to step into secondary or additional PPE. For example, 
I'm an electrician. I have to go and uh, throw a big switch. I have to climb into my 40, 50, 60 cal arc flash suit, and it's nine degrees in the yard. Be conscious of that because your single layer all day, every day, daily wear, not as big a condition. Now I climb into a multi-layer flash suit that is designed for the job function, be very, very cautious. Make sure that you have experience and time under that heat load on what you can expect. Uh, rain gear. We have rain during our summer months. It's now hot and humid and I have a barrier on. You have just eliminated your evaporatory cooling system and it's the only cooling system you have. You're going to accelerate uh, heat stress. High-vis vests, even though that doesn't sound like a lot, you're covering one-third of your torso, and you've lost that, that ability to evaporate in that area. So, again, be cautious. Chem protection, soil protection, any kind of the Tyvek, Tycam type barriers are going to be uh, contributing to uh, heat load and, and heat stress. So be, be very cautious. It's definitely going to be a contributor as you layer up. And I'm not talking about base layers and uh, the corresponding partner with your daily wear. I'm talking about layering up with uh, barriers and other fabrics to where you've got multiple layers and or barriers. So be cautious of that. Thing four, single layer FR clothing is no more of a contributor. Just kind of talked to that. The heat stress than non-FR clothing. Look at the clothing adjustment factor when you're talking about your wet bulb uh, globe heat index. Single layer clothing, regardless if it's FR or non-FR, is not a multiplier to potential heat stress. That doesn't take away the fact that there's perception that it is. Clothing in general can interfere with evaporation, which is the key to cooling. This includes discussion around long sleeve and short sleeve. Uh, Long sleeve, I'm protecting against that radiant load. Long sleeve, I'm also interfering with the body's natural ability to uh, perspire and evaporate. So be cautious of all these things. There are no absolutes. But again, use your observatory skills in the sense when you see folks that are working outside and under the load of the sun consistently they're going to want to protect their skin further and foremost and monitor if that's adding to their heat load factor in your base layers regardless of the hazard arc flash or flash fire when discussing undergarments only natural fibers are allowed per the standards no multiple fibers can be used under these layers and that is great uh, there is mounting evidence uh, to show that improved fr ar base layers that along with improved protection that allows for lighter weight outer layers thus reducing weight allowing for more open weave as the fiber density is not as essential to maximize the arc rating or other protective fabrics when it comes to FR. If, for example, you're wearing a 7-ounce Cat 2 shirt, pants are not a factor in that because we're very, for some reason, we're very accustomed to wearing 12 to 14 ounce non-FR denim. So when we're wearing 12 ounce and less FR pants, we don't seem to have as much pushback. The pushback is from the waist up. So when you're looking at wearing a, for example, a 7 ounce arc rated work shirt so you can get to your cat 2 of protection, there's some things to consider. I can go down to a Cat 1 shirt or less than 8 calories of protection. Let's say I go down to 6 calories of protection. Well, that's not going to meet the Cat 2 on my side. But when I go to my base layer, which is hydrophilic and help assist in moving moisture, aiding in my comfort, when those are layered together, the test results on that particular combination is 24 calories of protection, so it far exceeds what your minimum of eight would be, and you've potentially lowered the fabric weight of that outermost layer, letting folks be more comfortable. It's something to consider. It's not an absolute solution for everybody, but it is a way to get lighter layers to do more from a protection standpoint and ultimately make folks feel cooler and more comfortable through uh, the workday. As we look at five things to do in the cool, 
Uh, layer up. Layer up provides better insulation. A water repellent outer layer that we talked about, a middle layer to absorb sweat and provide insulation when, even when wet, and an inner layer of moisture wicking to keep moisture away from the body. Uh, two, ensure the integrity of your FRAR protection at each layer. This will is important because during our work day when it's cold, we're donning and doffing layers in order to not sweat. Uh, at 6 o'clock in the morning, it's minus 10. At 10 o'clock in late morning, it's zero. And at 2 o'clock in the afternoon, it's plus 5. I'm not going to be wearing the same layering combination necessarily throughout that workday. So I'm going to be donning and doffing garments so that I'm comfortable in that work environment. It's essential that each layer that you are exposing is equal to or greater than the hazard you have. I don't want to take off my 40 cal flame resistant arc rated jacket and expose my 5 or 10 cal uh, mid layer and I have a incident energy is potentially higher than that. Or I don't want to have a non-FR, worse I don't want to have a non-FR layer under there that I've now exposed, and that's extremely bad. So we want to ensure the integrity of our FRAR system, regardless of arc flash and flash flyer hazard, from the outermost layer to the innermost layer that's ever going to be exposed. And that includes zipping and unbutting just to get uh, cooled down from our workload. Cover. Now your extremities. You need to think about hats. You need to think about gloves. Uh, you're now introducing them into that flame-resistant arc-rated work environment. Uh, we want to talk about what those fabrics are going to be. You want to have flame-resistant engineering both in your, uh, whether that's a skull cap, whether that's a watchman's cap, whether that's a balaclava, whether those are gloves, mittens, whatever, you want to have FR engineering incorporated into those uh, so that those do not factor into any potential injury. So anything worn over flame-resistant arc ray garments must be tested to the hazard, or the whole system is potentially compromised. This is where you want to look at especially rainwear and high-vis vests, uh, is your rainwear uh, tested to the hazard? Is it ASTM 6413, and that's how it got to BEFR, or is it actually tested to ASTM 1891, which is for arc flash, ASTM 2733, which is flash fire? Better yet, both those standards are in your label telling you that they will resist uh, both those hazards, or has it simply been tested to the vertical flame test, which it has passed, and it's labeled as FR, and will fail miserably in your hazard, causing potentially unnecessary injury to the wearer? We see that in our rain gear. We see ASTM 6413 rain gear. We see ASTM 6413 vests. We see NFPA 701 vests. Uh, these will not perform in an arc flash or a flash fire. The other thing we want to make sure of, if when we're wearing our vest, vests do not have to be equal to or greater than the incident energies in our arc flash world. Why is that? They're not an outer layer. There is, they're not properly able to be buttoned up from the bottom to the top. They can't be tucked in, and they don't have any sleeves. So they actually don't factor into what's doing the protection. What's doing the protection is that outermost layer, whether that is your jacket, whether that is your sweatshirt, or whether that is your uh, button-up shirt or Henley shirt that you wear uh, underneath. Your vest can go over top of those. All it has to do is have a minimal arc rating. All it has to do is have an arc rating of two, four, six, uh, it doesn't have to meet or exceed the incident energies it's up against because it's not a garment. It just has to be rated uh, to the hazard. But if it's only got to an ASTM 6413, if it's only passed the vertical flame test, you potentially could be introducing a hazard because that vest will not hold up in an arc flash 
because it's never been tested to in that environment. Thing five, factor in your base layers. We've been talking about that in and around that through the whole presentation uh, in the second half here. Regardless of the hazard, arc flash or flash fire when discussing undergarments, natural fibers. Uh, however, the fact that managing sweat through doffing and donning is a huge concern in the, in the cold, make sure that you have a systems approach and that FR engineering equal to or greater than the hazards you are exposed to is available at each and every single layer for your people because they're going to be taking stuff off to monitor uh, their internal heat load with their external environment and trying not to overexert and sweat in the cold. So finding the balance uh, once you're protected is key. Unfortunately, there is no perfect fiber, thus no perfect fabric. It's all about finding the balance. Hydrophobic fibers absorb little or no moisture, but they're key for uh, strength and durability. Hydrophobic, hydrophilic fibers absorb a lot of moisture, but they tend not to be uh, the, the strongest of fibers. So you want to have that mix. You want to be able to pull moisture, then you want to be able to push it away. There's actually a science into developing these high-tech fabrics as we're going forward, and more and more of them are coming available in the uh, work environment. So bottom line, hydrate, uh, rest break, shade, cover, all the things that we are told to do. Schedule heavy workload during the warm or cooler part of the day. Uh, have them rest in warming or cooling tents. Dress in layers. Understand how layers work and cover your head, uh, especially in cold environments. Get them out of the wind. Uh, get them out of damp and wet clothing. Uh, acclimation programs and exposure limits with rest and work cycles are very, very appropriate and proven to be uh, minimizers of both heat stress and cold stress. And when it comes to selecting garments, wear trials. And please wear trials during the time that you're looking to implement them. Don't test your winter gear in spring and summer and don't test your summer gear in uh, winter and fall. I don't, need, I don't want to go through all the resources too much. I'm just going to speed through these because I want to save some time for Q&A, but there are tons of resources out there for you. Uh, OSHA, NIOSH, uh, I've all got available resources both on heat stress and cold stress. There's lots of posters and educational materials out there. Uh, there's lots of ways from even our American Conference of Governmental Industrial Hygienists have good, done some great work on, uh, on doing those work warm-up schedules during cold. We've got clothing adjustment factors going into that layering and what different uh, fabrics and fiber combinations have been tested to and how they can affect uh, thermal stress. So with that, that's my email. Contact me anytime. Uh, any questions. And uh, with that, I'm going to get it back to Barry so we can get on to some uh, Q&A. And if we do miss anything, or if I can't answer what you've asked, uh, I get to take it back with me. We've got tons of resources that we have access to, and we'll definitely get you an email with the information that can assist you. So again, thank you all for your time. Back to you now, Barry. Great. Thank you, Derek. We appreciate you sharing your knowledge with us today. And a reminder to our audience, if you'd like to ask a question today, simply type it in the text box in the lower left-hand corner of your screen and click that button for Submit Question. I also want to remind everyone of the evaluation survey, which should be appearing on your screen momentarily. Your feedback is really important to us because it does help us to improve our future webcasts. If you don't see the survey on your screen, please turn off your pop-up blocker or you may also access the evaluation survey by clicking the survey button near the lower right-hand portion of your screen. Now let's go ahead and get to a few questions here. Um, Derek, we have a question from Alsi, and Alsi asks, your thoughts about uh, dark clothing, uh, colors of clothing, clothing, dark clothing versus white clothing, for example, in the heat, and does it matter? Great question. There have been uh, a number of studies done, and we do look into that. Uh, obviously, reflecting of heat or uh, 
absorbing of heat uh, more directly. Darker colors do absorb more heat into the actual fabric. That's what they do. Uh, lighter colors uh, do not. So ideally, in warm environments, you would want to get into your light blues, uh, your khakis, etc. Uh, unfortunately, in the FR world, uh, we don't do a lot of white. Uh, primarily from a care and maintenance standpoint, obviously adding a bleach is a big no-no when it comes to flame-resistant arc-rated fabrics. So we don't want you doing that. Hence, we don't make a lot of white. But yes, uh, the studies do show there is some legitimacy to uh, getting into lighter colors during the hotter months. All right. And, you know, as you mentioned, Derek, COVID-19 has impacted the way everyone works now. And Raymond from our audience has a question about how do facial coverings and masks affect the heat load on the body? Great. That is, we've had a whole uh, 45 minutes on COVID and uh, cl FR cloth face coverings and what and how and where to implement those. Uh, I have not seen anything, nor am I aware of anything, uh, as how it directly correlates to uh, heat load. Uh, what I would do and what I would uh, speak to uh, with my team is obviously is as respiratory rates go up with exertion, as respiratory rates go up with stress, if you are finding that you feel the need to remove that, doff that uh, cloth face covering, uh, considerations to doing that and how to do that need to be addressed. I do not know of any factors taking into consideration uh, the environment and workload, uh, but obviously we just talked about heat stress and cold stress. If we are stressing, how do we measure stress? Well, heart rate, respiratory rate are two biggies. Uh, if we are breathing harder because we're working harder and we have a cloth face covering, I think common sense needs to be applied in how to accommodate that. So uh, summary, I don't have any direct data on how that affects either of those. I think uh, the eyeball test would say that anytime we're stressing and we have a cloth face covering on, I think we need to consider uh, how that's going to affect us and respond accordingly. All right. Thank you, Derek, for that. And uh, our next question here is from Vani, who asks, um, can short sleeves really be used as an FR layer? So uh, you can have short sleeves as an FR layer under a couple of very, very unique conditions. Uh, if I'm wearing a short sleeve base layer and I want to uh, – just remove ignitables. I don't want to have cotton. I don't want to have anything that could potentially ignite. I want to have a base layer that has FR properties, but I'm not factoring it into my systems approach as my increased ATPV or my increased arc rating more accurately in an electrical world. I just want to have the benefit of having a layer that won't ignite. Yeah, I can have a short sleeve base layer and I can have my button down over top of it. And as long as I'm not exposing those, uh, I'm not taking off that button down and exposing that short sleeve, I'm perfectly fine. The other case where we do see short sleeve flame resistant arc rated uh, shirts deployed is under the greater hazard. And where that would come into place is if I'm working in a confined area, let's say as an elevator repair person or an escalator, and I've got in there where I can get caught up on or there's moving pieces that could grab a sleeve and I could be pulled into, uh, you could make the argument that that's a greater hazard and it's a greater hazard than the potential arc flash and I'm going to remove my uh, sleeves and have a short sleeve deployed in that area. We have heard that argument and we have seen that solution. Uh, but other than that, you're absolutely right. None of the standards allow for short sleeves to be directly 
uh, in the hazard, aka arc flash. As an electrician, I have to have long sleeves. And for flash flyer, when we read NFPA 2113, it tells us we cover uh, all exposed areas where reasonable, and that would be wrist to shoulder on our shirts and coveralls in that environment. Okay. Derek, we've got time for one more today. And the question from our audience member is, is if you're layering, is it safe to wear a non-FR garment on, as an inner layer or a middle layer as long as that outer layer is FR? The easy answer is yes, as long as it's a natural fiber. And, but there are some considerations. So let's say, in your example, I am wearing my flame-resistant arc-rated brown duck jacket, which is very common. Underneath that, I have a 100% cotton sweatshirt. And then underneath that, I have my company button-up flame-resistant arc-rated shirt. So between my company button-down shirt, I have a cotton sweatshirt, and then I have my company brown duck jacket. And you would be perfectly fine. Under all the standards, it says, yes, I can have natural non-FR fibers underneath that outermost layer, as long as that outermost layer does not fail, open up, and expose that fuel, a.k.a. cotton. Where I struggle or where I, my concern would be is I'm obviously wearing that layered system because it's cold. Uh, as my workload heats up during the day, as the environment changes even subtly, and I go to unzip that outermost layer, I unzip my brown duck jacket, I've just exposed fuel. Uh, I unwittingly or just don't think about it, I remove my brown duck jacket, and now I'm sitting in my 100% cotton, aka fuel, sweatshirt with my button-down arc-rated shirt underneath. Now we have fuel on the outer layer and FR under, FRAR underneath, and that's a miserable combination. So, yes, you can do it. Yes, you'd have to be very, very cautious of allowing it because in that insulated component to where we're working throughout the day, we're constantly donning and doffing, and it'd be just a management nightmare to try and see who's wearing 100% uh, cotton or who's wearing FR cotton or who's wearing their uh, fleece or who's wearing their flame-resistant arc-rated fleece. It would just be very, very difficult uh, to police that, and it's better just to ensure that all they wear in those conditions is flame resistant arc rated layers and that removes any kind of concerns uh, from a garment standpoint. Okay, well thank you for that answer Derek. Unfortunately we've run out of time today. I'm sorry we didn't get to everyone's questions but all of today's unanswered questions will be forwarded along to Derek. Once again I hope you all take the time to fill out the evaluation survey to share your input. That ends today's Safety and Health Magazine webcast. I'd like to thank our outstanding presenter, Derek Sang, everyone from our sponsor at Bulwark, and all of you who listened in today. Have a safe day, everyone.